So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Brooks Roach. I am a diabetes education specialist with Diabetes Canada. And uh, I would like to begin by welcoming you and acknowledging that I am joining this webinar from the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, wherever you're joining and watching from, I invite you to express gratitude and reflect for a moment on, on the, the land on which we live and acknowledge the past inhabitants of the lands on which, uh, which we now call Canada. We are here today to talk about a uh, really you know, timely topic, which is returning to school for people and caregivers living with type 1 diabetes, both during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're joined today, we have the pleasure of having three wonderful guests, uh, Dr. Constantine Saman, who is a pediatric endocrinologist and associate professor at McMaster University and McMaster Children's Hospital. Welcome, Constantine. We have Elizabeth Morrow, Director of Communications and Knowledge Translation at the Canadian Pediatric Society, where she manages the Diabetes at School project. Welcome, Liz. And we have Amanda Sturzik, who is our very own Manager of Research and Public Policy with Diabetes Canada and a Type 1 mom. Uh, so I want to welcome the three of you and, and thank you very much for being here. Today, our experts will be answering some key questions that they and Diabetes Canada have been hearing on this topic. We'd also like to note that there is no right answer to this, and you should always consider your own family and your own situation uh, around key decisions relating to school. We will also be taking questions from you, our viewers. So um, some questions have already been submitted, and you can ask your own now. Uh, by replying at any time throughout the webinar in the comments section on Facebook Live. So we're going to get started with a question for uh, Dr. Saman, which is, at this time, given that many Canadians, especially adults, have received the COVID-19 vaccine, what risks are remaining from the pandemic for individuals, especially children who live with type 1 diabetes? And what's the relationship there? Well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Brooks. And again, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the lands that uh, I live in, uh, which uh, the indigenous people of this land have called home for thousands of years. And uh, I thank them for their stewardship of the land. Uh, I think the uh, pandemic certainly uh, has evolved uh, since we had uh, a similar meeting last year. And uh, one of the things uh, that have changed, of course, is the vaccinations that have rolled out over the past several months. And it is so great that so many Canadians have chosen to get the vaccines. And uh, the current rates of vaccinations, of course, has allowed us to open the economy and, and think about opening the schools as well. However, this is not a time to let our guard down and new variants, including the Delta variant, is something that has been watched very carefully. Uh, the good news is that vaccines still continue to provide protection uh, against this variant. Uh, and also the, the children who are less than 12 years of age are not yet eligible for this vaccine, of course, which is something that's very important for us to think about. So I think these are probably the, the main issues that we're considering and watching uh, at this point. Thanks very much, Constantine. And now many folks with and without type one diabetes are nervous about returning to in-person classes. Mm -hmm. So I wanna ask what your advice would be to children and youth who are impacted by type one diabetes or other complex health conditions, including for example, type two diabetes. Yes, this is a very important question. Uh, I think the goal uh, is really to get kids and youth back uh, in a safe uh, manner to return to school. And so uh, kind of talking to school now and discussing the specific needs of children and youth who are returning to getting ready to what these needs would be uh, to ensure a safe return is really critical. Uh, I think school has many benefits for children and youth really beyond learning. In some cases, school is an important place for nutrition, sometimes safety checks on children. So I do favor a return to school um, and careful planning should ensure a safe return. Um, one of the focuses I think for us is really those who are less than 12 years of age or are unvaccinated and the virus circulation in the communities and especially the Delta variant uh, that are perhaps, and there are other variants perhaps that will emerge over the coming months that needs to be monitored. Uh, it is important to know that children uh, with diabetes don't have a higher risk of getting 
COVID. Uh, and uh, even if they do, the, they are not at a higher risk of getting severe infection. Um, regular sick day measures, uh, should a child or youth with diabetes get COVID uh, provided by diabetes team uh, and consultation with the team if uh, diabetes control uh, is not necessarily uh, moving according to plan is really critical to try and address um, you know, the management of diabetes at home with a COVID infection. Uh, infections of children are happening. This is a true. However, uh, just to give you some perspective, uh, only about 2% of children who are getting the infection are actually requiring hospitalization. And then even a much smaller number is needing uh, intensive care unit admission. And these are usually children who have chronic uh, conditions. We don't have the breakdown for diabetes, but the numbers would be very, very small at this point. Um, most children either have no symptoms or have mild symptoms, and the risk of complications is actually quite small. Um, I think vaccinations continue to provide uh, really an important anti-transmission strategy, and of course, they are preventing severe infections. So for those who are older than 12 years of age and for their caregivers, uh, considering the vaccine is, is really an important strategy. Um, and this is important not only for schools, but I think when extracurriculars are going to be uh, launching again, uh, there might be a need to, to provide vaccination status. Um, those who are less than 12 years of age then who are not yet eligible to get a vaccine, uh, there will be data available uh, by September, we think, uh, at this point for this age group and perhaps vaccine rollouts at the end of the year or early 2022. The best protection we can offer them is by really building a wall of immunity around them by vaccinating the people around them. Uh, and that, uh, again, coupled with other strategies that have been implemented over the past several months, uh, it's really important to stay home if sick. Uh, screening should play an important part in isolating uh, those who are exposed to the virus. I think isolation, if symptoms develop, testing and contact tracing remains crucial to, for us to limit the, the infections. Uh, using masks, um, social distancing, and, and maintaining air quality and proper ventilation, and air filtration, and, and close the space is really critical continuing to maintain clean surfaces. Um, public health are critical partners in this in terms of close monitoring of community circulation of COVID uh, is really uh, gonna be important. Again, going back to school this year. And again, uh, following sick day management protocols, should there be a COVID infection would be really important. Uh, this advice will apply for type one and type two diabetes um, in children. Uh, in my view, uh, and uh, I believe it does offer us a safe path to return to school. Okay. Thank you, Constantine. I think I, I appreciate the, the the framing of providing that wall of protection by by vaccinating other folks. I think oftentimes people um, people are rightfully feeling a sense of sense of anxiety around you know if my child isn't eligible to receive a vaccine, what can I possibly do? Mm -hmm. And I think that. You know, mental image almost of, of building that wall of, of defenses is a, is a really powerful one. Um, our next question is, is for Liz, and it's as a professional and as a parent, what is your position on whether folks with type 1 diabetes ought to pursue any exceptions or accommodations in a school environment, especially given this public health climate? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, so I think any conversation about exceptions or accommodations needs to start with a reminder of uh, the rights of kids with diabetes, which are essentially the same as any other student in school. So they have the right to be safe, they have the right to be supported, and they have the right to be included. And so it's all of our duties to do the things that ensure that those rights are upheld, regardless of whether or not there's a pandemic. Um, that should not be a barrier to participating fully in school. So you know, parents need to remember that schools have a duty to provide care and to accommodate for disabilities, which type one is. So like any other school year, families need to ask for what their children need to be supported at school and expect those rights to be upheld. And I think that this year, you know, more than ever, there was so much disruption in the last school year. Uh, we know that kids' mental health has been affected, parents' mental health has been affected. So there's probably a little more planning that needs to be done, uh, both on the home front and in school. 
Um, you know, parents and kids who did a lot of online learning, there may be some anxiety going back to school um, in kind of letting go of the reins a little bit. We're at home, we have everything under control, um, more hands-on support. So it's really critical that everybody be prepared to, to support kids at school. We also know that teachers and uh, principals and educators are going to have a lot on their plate at the start of this school year. So, um, you know, some kids are starting next week, perhaps the week after. Uh, it's really important to get in touch with them sooner than later and try to be understanding with their situation um, that, you know, time may be limited and opportunities to meet in person may be limited. However, it's also really important that kids with diabetes start school on time. Uh, that diabetes not be used as a, a reason for delaying entry into school, particularly this year after all the disruption. Um, so, you know, those supports need to be in place so that kids are safe from day one. Um, we know that every student's needs will be different depending on their age, their level of self-care, um, but even older kids, kids in middle school, high school, are going to need things like accommodations for tests, for example. Um, if they experience a low in the middle of an exam, they're going to need time to treat and to recover, so some extra time to do their test. Um, and regardless of uh, where a child is in any school environment where there's a child with diabetes, everybody needs to know at minimum how to uh, recognize and treat a low blood sugar. And I just want to mention before I, before I close that um, Diabetes at School just yesterday actually launched um, an online teaching module for educators and school staff. So to help, it's for them, but it's also for all of you as parents to help facilitate that training process. So I will, um, I'm not sure if people can see a chat or if I could leave it in a Facebook comment, but I'll provide that link so that folks can go and access it and hopefully make that training process a little bit easier so that you as parents can focus on the specifics of your child's situation. Thanks very much, Liz. And, and on the note of sharing uh, resources and information, there's going to be two ways we can, can leave a, a Facebook comment with some, some links to some interesting and helpful resources as well. It'll be included in the, the description of the YouTube video when this, this recording goes on YouTube. So if you'd like to access it later, hear, hear something over again and or access those resources, uh, you can check out our YouTube channel. Um, our next question is for Amanda. And it's essentially, what's your take on this? So as not only an expert in science and policy around the situation, but as the parent of a soon-to-be post-secondary student, how does this change the situation? Does it change it, and how does it change, if so? Uh, thanks for that, Brooks. Well, it's it's been tough. We can, you know, everybody has the same level of anxiety and exhaustion from what we went through in the past year and a half. It's been necessary, um, but taxing on the students, teachers, and parents. And speaking from our experience, the school closures have been quite difficult for high school students, especially in their final years of high school. And just to reiterate what Elizabeth was saying about anxiety, the anxiety of not having done any, written any tests or exams for a year and a half is a huge issue for um, young people going into first year university. Our daughter, who has type 1 diabetes, was relieved, as were we, to hear that her university of choice will be open for in-person learning this fall. That's as of now. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. In terms of elementary and secondary schools, all the provinces and territories are currently planning for in-person learning when school resumes for the 2021-2022 school year. Um, I just want to reiterate also what Elizabeth was saying regarding the supports for students living with diabetes. Pandemic or not, they need an individual care plan that outlines their daily and emergency diabetes management plan, and it needs to be supported by school staff. Across the country, we know that there's inconsistency with mandatory guidelines for students with diabetes in school. Diabetes of Canada is in the process of updating our comparison document where we highlight the gaps in the policies across the various provinces and territories. Now, a few months ago, maybe June, Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table released guidelines and research on children returning to school in school learning in the fall. And I just want to um, quote what they had to say about children with medical needs. 
the additional resource requirements to facilitate safe return to school should not be a barrier to meaningful access to in-person education for any child. And we at Diabetes Canada agree with this assessment. Our guidelines for the care of students living with diabetes at school outline necessary components of a comprehensive diabetes management policy. This type of policy will ensure students' physical health and safety, but it also reinforces their right to be full and equal participants in school and all school-related activities without a fear of being excluded, stigmatized, or discriminated against because of their diabetes. Thanks, Amanda. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, this is not a question we had discussed before, but I think we've all to some degree touched on it. And I'm wondering if, if I can gauge the three of your thoughts, if you, if you'd like to share, and it's, it's around, you know, pandemic or not the importance of developing the capacity to adv advocate for oneself in a school setting. Um, what, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just state a little bit of the, some of the resources that are out there for from a student perspective if you know if we have students who are watching this tuning in if they're wondering um it can be hard enough to stand up for you know what what they need if they live with diabetes let alone adding a, a pandemic into the mix what advice would you have and what would be sort of a a next step or a, or a piece of guiding advice you could provide do you want me to go first <laughs> So uh, certainly the diabetes at school um, resource is, is really beneficial. And I think, um, you know, as our daughter went through high school, she became more independent with interacting with school staff around her needs. And, you know, at post-secondary level, she's an adult now, so she has to take on ownership. So it's just, you know, making sure you're having the conversations with people, understanding at a post-secondary institution, you need to be proactive as parents, caregivers of younger students do when we're contacting school officials. Um, and it becomes an even bigger issue about having the uh, permissions to be able to take food and drink into classes and exams to treat a low, have your um, you know, uh, glucose monitor or your phone if you use an app to read your glucose monitor that you're able to use so that you're not having it taken away um, during exams, that type of thing. So it's just, it's making sure that you're, you know, doing the research and being vocal and, um, and talking to your healthcare providers, your healthcare team, because they often will have the experience of having other um, people go through young adults who've been asking for help with completing forms that are required in post-secondary so they you know they will know what's needed for you to go through and and make sure that you have the accommodations you require i i fully agree with amanda on all the points that she raised and i would uh, add maybe for younger children again for parents to advocate uh, with a school but also again to speak with the diabetes team to have uh, any services that are available for support in a school like blood sugar checks or insulin administration to be ready um, you know, to support the, the, the child or youth when they return to school. I think the, the only other thing I would add is when I think of advocacy, I think of, you know, um, kind of preventative advocacy and building that starts really with building relationships, right? Especially when our kids are younger and we as parents are kind of in control of the whole school situation. Um, we can help set the stage, I think, for their own personal advocacy um, by what we model and modeling, um, forging good relationships, uh, relationships that are full of communication with the, the people at school, with the office staff, with the teachers, uh, with the principal, um, being very upfront about you know, the diabetes to the degree that your child is comfortable, of course, but always, you know, putting it forward as this is just a part of this is a part of our lives. And, you know, we need to do what we need to do to to keep you safe and, you know, to keep you healthy every day. Um, but really thinking about those relationships and the mutual benefit, always communicating that mutual benefit. So, um, yes, my child needs these things, but also by learning about this condition, you can prevent 
you know, the worst case scenarios that people are so afraid of and fearful of. We never have to get to glucagon if we have good processes in place on a, on a daily basis. Thanks, everyone. I, I really resonate, you know, as someone who lives with type 1, I really resonate with that sort of uh, relationship based rather than uh, you know, almost worst possible outcome based because it's very understandable as someone that's not familiar to be fearful of having to use glucagon or having to engage when someone's, you know, experiencing a crisis. And uh, I think that's just really a really important message to, to build it around the relationship between the individual and the, and the care provider or uh, teacher or whomever it might be, rather than saying this person might experience a really shocking traumatic event and you need to be prepared. That may, that, that can still be true, but it can be, it can, the foundation can be, the, the quality of the relationship and the, and the ongoing conversations. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to open the floor to a few questions that we've received now. So um, the first one is, uh, is from a, a viewer who asks, how do you quote unquote build a wall surrounding your kids with vaccines when the classmates surrounding them aren't of age to get a vaccine? So I think this, this comes back to that, that element of you know, protection within a, a family unit or within folks that they often interact with, but recognizing that that may not uh, extend into the classroom. So that's an important point. I think the the issue of trying to protect uh, the children as, you know, as far as we can until these vaccines are available to this age group is really important. And um, I think there are several approaches that have been taken now. Uh, today, for example, the Toronto District School Board has mandated that, uh, you know, the, the school uh, staff will need to be vaccinated to, uh, again, prepare that return to school. Uh, the additional measures that are taken within that, those spaces that children are in are going to also play a part in a protection. Uh, but also remembering that actually children also spend time outside the school and then by providing community supports and protections for them, we reduce the chance. Um, we're not going to eliminate the chance of an infection. This virus is out there and some children will get infected. This is true. Uh, I think applying all these measures, again, until we get to the vaccination stage of, of young children, um, will reduce the, the risk uh, and make it more manageable for us. Um, can I just jump in? I wanted to go back to what Elizabeth said about building the relationships and having conversations in the school. And I think a part of this is also having conversations with other parents in your child's classroom, because they're all going to be in the same boat with not being able to have the kids vaccinated, you know, so making sure that you all sort of have a common front about reinforcing the public health measures, the mask wearing, the physical distancing, the good hand hygiene, keeping your kids home from school if they're sick, um, so that, you know, it can be sort of a wall, a community wall versus just trying to fight on your own in the classroom. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is there was a great analogy in, in epidemiology about, you know, how to keep case numbers down and how to minimize the spread. And it's called the Swiss cheese analogy. And the idea is that no one measure is perfect. And when you look at um, a stack of slices of Swiss cheese, each slice has holes, but they're in different spots. So when you stack them up, when you have everyone who's eligible to be vaccinated has been fully vaccinated, you know, you're following the public health measures, you're doing the contact tracing and the testing, you're staying home and isolating if you have symptoms or if you've tested positive, as you stack all of them up, you close all the holes so you're less likely to have the community spread. It's a great point, Amanda, thank you. And, and thanks for your answer, Constantine. Um, we have another question, and it's uh, it's a little bit extraneous to the, the topic, but I think it's really interesting and timely. Um, and the question is, what government party is doing what for diabetics, uh, recognizing we're in federal election mode right now? Now, full disclosure: if you don't, uh, if you're not fully up to date on different platforms, that's that's okay. There's a lot of pages to, to rifle through. But does anyone have any any thoughts on that?
So seeing none, I think I appreciate the question and I would probably, I would direct you to, to look at the different party platforms. Um, they're generally quite searchable. They would have a section on health um, to which a reviewer asked this question. Um, I, I would look through the platforms and see and see where, where they, they specifically make reference to, uh, to diabetes care. And um, you know, if, if so, to compare which party is, is proposing what measures or you know what uh, what they're proposing to stop, start, and continue, and that that will help you help you understand. And if you if you would like to ask more, you can shoot an email to to us at info at diabetes.ca, and we can can do some uh, try to help you. We we have another question, um, which is it was submitted sort of at the beginning of the webinar, and it was how long does it take to reverse your pre diabetes pre diabetes diagnosis? Um, so again, not necessarily to do with, with returning to school, but a valid question nonetheless. Um, perhaps, Constantine, do you have any, any thoughts on this? Um, I suppose the question is uh, related to perhaps children uh, who are dealing with uh, insulin resistant and perhaps being overweight and are in the impaired the glucose tolerance phase, which is an intermediate stage between having normal metabolism and developing type 2 diabetes. I suspect that's what the question is related to. Um, there isn't really a clear answer in youth, um, and it is not a very well studied area either. Uh, it all depends on the drivers of uh, the impaired um, insulin uh, or glucose tolerance and targeting those specific factors through specific strategies, including things like lifestyle intervention with healthy nutrition and physical activity, cutting down screen time, um, maintaining uh, good mental uh, health. Uh, but also more recently, there has been evidence to suggest actually using medications like metformin, which is a, a drug that is used in type 2 diabetes that appears to be quite effective in improving sensitivity to insulin and actually reducing the, the uh, risk of maintaining impaired glucose tolerance and reversing that to normal glucose tolerance. So these are the strategies that we would use in youth to try and reverse. Uh, the timeline for reversal, if, it's, if the program is followed and if medications are effective, because again, there are multiple drivers here, um, usually is within months and maybe up to 12 months before we see the full result. Uh, but again, that's really highly dependent on the uniqueness of each person and, and what factors are driving that insulin resistance in them. Thanks very much for the answer. Um, we, we have a question, uh, and this, this viewer says, my son and I are both type 1 with asthma and fully vaccinated. However, his classes at CEGEP are jam-packed with no space between students at all. How safe is it to return to school in this situation? And, and sorry, how old is uh, your child? Um, doesn't not seeing okay, that. So but if that viewer, uh, if you'd like to to comment to follow up, follow up on mm -hmm. uh, the age of your son, perhaps we can. Right well, say Shep, they would be probably 17 or 18 for mm -hmm. Shep. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would suggest that the same kind of points and, and elements that we've highlighted really would apply in this particular case. Um, if diabetes is well controlled and, and um, if asthma is well controlled, I think the uh, and if vaccinations are in a place uh, the precautions for indoor activities are applied, uh, that will reduce the, the risk of, uh, of acquiring the, the infection. Um, spacing uh, in the schools is going to be a challenge in some spaces. Uh, but again, there are multiple other ways that schools are trying to deal with this. Um, and every school probably is going to be unique in how they approach that challenge because no school is probably similar to the other one. Uh, but again, I think the, the same elements that apply to diabetes that we've highlighted will apply in, in, in this particular case. Thank you. We have, we have another uh, question from a type one parent who says, uh, my four-year-old daughter was diagnosed with type one in the spring. 
She's returning to school this fall. We've been told that her EA, educational assistant, will have eight students to manage. Do you have any tips or advice on how we can ensure uh, that my daughter receives proper care throughout the day? Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, uh, an important stage uh, for your daughter to, to go to school, which is fantastic. And uh, the question again, with, with the younger children, um, especially uh, the four-year-olds, five-year-olds, there are going to be perhaps different approaches to um, managing the, the cohorts in a school. I think the conversations at the moment are about younger children being more in cohorts compared to older children. Um, and I suspect that eight unit, I'm suspecting this is the cohort that is gonna be traveling around. Um, uh, again, the, the question of spacing of students within that space, within the environment, uh, using masks if the space is limited, proper ventilation, filtration of that space, uh, good hand hygiene. Um, and, and this is, again, can be practiced as a group with the EA, perhaps helping the, the young children do that together and developing those habits, cleaning those surfaces, keeping them uh, pristine for kids to use. Uh, all these things will help reduce that risk. Can I comment on the piece, the question about the diabetes care? And um, so if I understand, this is a little one who's going to kindergarten for the first time, hasn't been to school. Um, and then there's an EA with other students to manage. And I think uh, typically, I don't know where this, where this parent is, but I know in Ontario, uh, EAs are often um, helping out kids with behavioral difficulties or learning difficulties, and then a little bit of their time is carved out to check a blood sugar and so on. So one can imagine um, the challenges for an EA with all that on his or her plate. And so I think this is where I might engage in a conversation with the principal about finding someone else in the school who can help out your daughter, um, because I would be concerned about the level of care and also about the safety, um, you know, when it comes to just, you know, checking blood sugars and, and treating lows and things like that, especially with a little one who is both young and newly diagnosed and may or may not feel lows. I don't know what kind of technology you have to work with, if you have a CGM or if she's on a pump, but of course those things would factor in. Um, but I really think that this is a, you know, you're in a tough situation, but it's um, a, a question of really kind of communicating to uh, the principal what it is that your daughter needs. Uh, perhaps the principal is not entirely clear on what that is, uh, but it seems to me anyway unreasonable to be one of eight, um, especially in kind of the, the well, I, I shouldn't even say especially in the current environment, in any environment, being one of eight um, doesn't seem very reasonable to me. Um, I know when my daughter was in kindergarten, she, she was diagnosed in April and started kindergarten in September. Um, and we were told we couldn't have an EA's time, which um, is what's got me started in advocacy in the first place. Um, but thankfully, the ECEs, because we're here in Ontario and there are ECEs in the classroom, the kindergarten classrooms, the ECEs agreed to be trained to check her blood sugar and help her out. So sometimes there are options. I, understand, I realize that principals cannot mandate anyone to do this work, but it is um, heartening how many people in the school system, in schools, are willing to step forward and volunteer to help our kids. And can I just jump in, and I want to mention too that, and Brooks is going to put the link in for this, that the Diabetes Canada guidelines um, for the care of students with living with diabetes in school has specific information about daily and emergency diabetes management that is sort of, you know, that is required and that we really recommend all schools ensure that kids with type one or type two have these plans in place. It's part of their individual care plan. And I just wanna say, I was thinking about this as um, my daughter was eight when she was diagnosed. And the one thing I can think of in terms of COVID for parents of children with diabetes, the sil there is a silver lining in that there's no issues around 
food sharing in school. I'm sure those of you who have kids with type one have had issues with either kids being excluded because someone's brought cupcakes in or they've gone high or low um, based on whether or not they've been allowed it or it's been planned and the timing has been changed. So in my mind, it's a little bit of a bonus that shared food in the classroom isn't happening in the time of COVID. So it helps a little bit with management of diabetes. They're only eating the food that you send to school with them. Thank you all those really helpful answers. Um, we have a, a question that's that says a side note. Uh, this person is is an EA in Ontario and also a type one mom. Uh, and she says that EAs are not allowed to do diabetes care as part of their role, which is just, I think, worth noting. Um, we, we, we have a question as well that says, uh, our, our child with type diabetes is entering school for the first time next week for primary school. In their experience, uh, the endo clinic and the school have both told them to quote unquote, manage their expectations regarding what they can expect for care in school. Um, wondering if, if the, we have any advice. Uh, it's this person's stance that type one kids should have the support to be safe and healthy. And it doesn't seem like the system is set up to offer both. I think uh, Elizabeth uh, highlighted this issue earlier. Um, uh, yeah, I think the expectation probably re needs to be recalibrated in favor of a safe and, and effective diabetes management strategy for your child in school. And, you know, um, I completely agree with, um, with you, uh, with this parent um that your 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 child should be safe and healthy i'm sure this is um a time of anxiety for you thinking about you know hearing that from the school and even from your clinic and and sending your child back to school for the first time it, it must be incredibly anxiety provoking um but i think that you have the right attitude that uh, your child should be safe and healthy and one thing that's changed in the years um, since I think Amanda's daughter was diagnosed and my daughter is that um, there are so many um, experts and, and strong, credible groups standing behind you. Um, you know, uh, groups of experts like Dr. Saman who are saying, this is, you know, your, all of our kids have the right to go to school. They have the right to full participation. They don't sit on the sidelines anymore because we're not sure what to do and whether they're going to go high or low. No, they have the right to participate. There are lots and lots of resources. So those barriers are gone. Um, there's Diabetes Canada's uh, guidelines. There are guidelines from the Canadian Pediatric Society and the Canadian Pediatric Endocrine Group. So, you know, all of the experts who care for our kids are in agreement um that this is what our kids should have so you're not alone as a parent when you go to school and you say no my my son or daughter has has the right to start school on time um and let's work together to figure out what we can do to to make it happen and it may mean at the you know at the beginning of the school year if you can kind of set yourself up to provide a little more support and be a little more available um, but just to get them off on the right foot uh, and for them and to demystify it a little bit so that they see that oh this isn't as scary as i thought it was going to be we can do this you know as a school community um because more often than not you know people come together and they come they come through so um good luck <laughs> thank you folks and i think like you know myself um having grown up and gone through public school living with type one um, it's been pretty amazing to watch the, the evolution and to look now and see how many wonderful groups and experts are, you know, behind the cause and have so much, so many resources out there to, to be used. And there, there's such a wealth of information and data and support. There is a lot of community behind this too. So it can feel quite like a, like quite a lonely condition at times, but there are a lot of folks in the same boat and a lot of folks that, um, have, you know, next steps and have tools for you to make use of. Um, we have another question that says, what advocacy is being done to ensure sports are not shut down this year? My 15 year old daughter's insulin needs doubled when Ontario shut down from November to June, and we saw insulin resistance. 
With the return to sports, in this case swimming, she is sensitive again, so less insulin is required. We dread another shutdown. Well, I can say that the Canadian Pediatric Society has advocated for um, a return to all extracurriculars. So, um, and my understanding in Ontario, at least, is that that's the plan, um, is for sports and extracurriculars to continue. Um, you know, if and when that's pulled back, uh, we certainly will be advocating and, and we do have um, info on our website or, or statements on our website to that effect if anyone wants to reference them in their, you know, in their communities. And um, another resource is Change for Good Health. Diabetes Canada participated in an initiative that came out of um, the founder of Good Life Fitness earlier this year because uh, they were really concerned about the reduction in physical activity across all age groups. So they have some great resources as well. Thanks, everyone. And uh, I think that's that's the end of, of the, the questions we've received. But uh, I want to say sincere thank you to our experts for giving such thoughtful advice. Um, a lot of folks expressing their gratitude. So I want to pass that on to, to all of you that it's uh, making a real impact to to people that have that care enough to attend this and ask questions so it means a lot to get this this level of of advice and and to be heard so thank you um so that's that's all from from our, our viewers so thank you for uh, for your questions and i'd like to just take a moment before we wrap up to tell you a bit about how diabetes canada and a few other organizations are helping to support this cause so as mentioned, uh, there's been reference made to the guidelines for the care of students living with diabetes at school. Uh, there are interprovincial comparison documents for kids in school with diabetes. So you can compare based on your province, how that stacks up and what the current situation is for your province or territory. Um, we have resources specifically around COVID-19 and diabetes. Um, diabetes at school, as mentioned, uh, Liz has done some wonderful work and, and there's a lot of resources there. Uh, and there's also a, uh, an initiative through McMaster Children's Hospital and Hamilton Health Sciences Foundation that Constantine had shared, uh, and that's at www.covid19childhooddiabetes.com. And again, all those will be shared in the comments and uh, on our, our YouTube video. So you can feel free to visit our website, our social media at any time to stay up to date on our work and resources. And if you'd like specific direction, you can call the Diabetes Canada helpline at 1-800-BANTING or email info at diabetes.ca for any questions, and we'll do our best to give you direction. Um, I want to give another sincere thank you to our guests for your time and, and your, your thoughtful responses. Before we, we wrap up, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our viewers? Uh, I just want to say for parents out there, we're all behind you. We've been in the situation and we know it can feel lonely, but we can't be in the classroom with you or in the principal's office talking to them. But, you know, we've put all these resources out there for people and we're there in spirit with you. So, you know, be strong and, and be there for your kids because, uh, you know, you're their best advocate. And I would say, actually, it is really important to connect with your diabetes teams and have their support as well. Ask questions, look for information, uh, and don't be afraid to reach out. It's really uh, an important time. We understand how hard these times are. And if there are any questions, if there are any issues, again, feel free to reach out to your diabetes team. I can't say it any better than what you both said. Agree, you're not alone and reach out for, for help if, um, if you feel that your child's health, safety or inclusion is being compromised in any way. Thanks so much, folks. Um, to our viewers, please, uh, again, never, never hesitate to reach out to us, Diabetes Canada, or to uh, the other organizations that we'll, we'll share shortly. Um, you know, personally, I really hope I, I found this to be such a wonderful conversation. And I hope that this was helpful for uh, you, our viewers. And uh, thank you again for, for joining us and, and being part of this conversation. I wish you all, all the best in uh, the coming back to school season. And 
thank you and, and take care everyone bye now bye